welcome uh, Professor Zupan, Daniela Zupan, Zupan your um, assistant uh, professor of European cities and urban heritage uh, at Dalhaus University in uh, Weimar. And you defended the PhD uh, in urban studies in 2019 uh, in architecture and Slavic, and after uh, a diploma in, architect, in architecture and Slavic studies in Austria. Uh, you were postdoc fellow at the higher schools of economics in Moscow in Russia, so that you can you know very well the Russian urban context. And uh, you study uh, generally how politics and economics drivers shape urban planning and design in European studies in the 20th and in the 21st centuries. You have been involved in a research project about urban conflicts in Germany, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, I must say that we are very uh, impatient to hear you about uh, these uh, topics, you know, very well. And I can already announce to the audience that you will be present in Lyon uh, physically <laughs> in April uh, for a, a field mission about the renovation of large housing estates because you are much interested in this topic. We both and we, <laughs> we also. And uh, in the context of the Cher Habiter Ensemble La Ville de Demain, uh, you will hold a, a field mission in Lyon to visit some examples of renovation of large housing estates together with uh, Genola Inizan, uh, which you know also from, uh, from your field of, of studies. So I will inform about this day because you is, uh, we, you, we also have a, a seminar with you together with you, so it may be interesting to discuss once again with you when you will be in Lyon. So I, uh, I let you speak uh, your conference and uh, come back for the questions afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I will first try to share my screen and you tell me if it's um, not working. Please wait. It's OK. Oh, no, no, I can do it full screen. I think then it will be better. So. Does it work? Can you see like the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, perfect. OK, then uh, thanks Lydia and Laura uh, for these introductory words and for inviting me to the seminar. Um, yeah, the title is Authoritarian Urbanism, a viable concept with a question mark. And um, this also means that today I will hardly present any results, but instead like a topic that I'm working on uh, rather recently, so authoritarian urbanism and the question if uh, this is a concept um, worth working with. Um, this, the topic em emerged out of my engagement to understand like urban developments in contemporary Russia. Um, seeking for ways to explain what is happening there, I encountered like limits in the approaches I used so far and I started to ask myself if maybe the concept of authoritarian urbanism might be a fruitful lens to look at these processes. So um, the aim of today's seminar is to, to have a discussion about questions uh, such as if this concept um, is a viable one for exploring contemporary urban developments, if so, and how, how to define it. So um, to be honest, for the moment, I have more open questions than answers, and I'm very much looking forward uh, very much to discuss them with you. Um, please, if you have like concrete questions during the lecture, just let me know and speak out. If not, we'll just discuss it afterwards. So I hope you can now see the second slide. So how is my short um, input structured? I will first start with the relevance and the topicality of authoritarian urbanism, and then excuse I will. Me, me, excuse yes? me. We know. We know. Uh, we see uh, still the first slide. Yeah. Oh. Still. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, now it's working. It's good. Yeah, it's good. But now it's not so nice, right? It's not. It's okay. We can screen. we can read. Yeah. Okay. I'm very sorry. Always the techniques. 
<laughs> okay, so here is like the structure of today's talk. So after the, the starting point, I will present like the state of research and draw attention to two main subfields that engage with um, with and yeah, that engage actually with current forms of authoritarian urbanism and talk a bit about how they conceptualize it. I will then try to test both approaches by applying them to the case of Moscow, and I will use this case to reflect on the potentials, but also difficulties and possible limits of these two approaches. And then uh, I'll give a short conclusion and uh, would like to start like the discussion. Um, the relevance of the topic in general terms is, I think, very well known. So in the last decades, scholars observe like rising authoritarian tendencies globally, but also within Europe. Um, we have debates on post-democracy, post-politics, the great regression, democratic backsliding, etc., which actually all point to the strengthening of authoritarian trends, also in what we are used to to refer to as like the settled, stable, liberal, democratic countries of the global north. Um, just as an example, I put here this, this list. It's the, the top 10 list of regressing countries. That is like those countries with the sharpest rise of authoritarian, authoritarian tendencies in the last decade as measured by VDEM, an institute that engages like with these questions um, pretty profoundly. And you see that, of course, it's not only European countries, but that it's many Europe European countries like in this list, such as Hungary, Turkey, Poland and Serbia. Well, um, as urban scholars, the question then, of course, arises how these processes, this rising authoritarianism actually affects cities and what are the effects on urbanism? Um, and like thinking about that, an observation was haunting and puzzling me. So while on the one hand, we observe like this rising authoritarianism around the globe, we also see like the rise and the surge of like human centered design approaches, progressive designs, the upgrading of public spaces, participatory planning, evidence based governance. So the rise of elements that we usually associate with democracies and some such as participatory planning even being understood like as a democratic element. Um, here you just see a couple of pictures um, from Moscow urban transformations where these like new policies are implemented heavily and gained strength in the last decades. But you could also look at um, examples from Turkey, China, Iran, Belarus, etc. to see the rise of such policies. Um, and I, I think that these developments somehow put, put into question what we usually associate with um, authoritarian urbanism, namely very repressive interventions, arbitrary, intransparent, Ill illegitimate decision making processes, but also maybe spectacular, symbolically charged mega projects. So I think for me, the question then arises what what this rise of democratic or at least seemingly dem democratic elements in contemporary authoritarian regimes actually means. Um, do they indicate like a development towards political liberalization and democratization? Or is it rather the contrary that such elements play more and more a role in stabilizing authoritarian regimes. Um, so the question is if maybe um, authoritarian urbanism shows like something like a new face in the 21st century. Um, and th this blurring of boundaries between autocracies and democracies has been observed also like in the other direction. So it's not only that we observe a rise of at least seemingly democratic elements in authoritarian regimes, but also the rise of authoritarian elements and practices in democratic contexts. Um, so against this background, the question arises, what is authoritarian urbanism then actually? And can we find a way to think all of this together? And um, if so, how? 
Well, to approach these questions, um, for me, the first step was to conduct a thorough literature analysis to see how the effects of rising authoritarianism um, on urbanism are taken up in urban studies. Um, it's important to note that uh, first, like the intention was not to look at urban developments in autocratic regimes, but my focus really was to look at this interplay, like the rising authoritarian tendencies and what this means for urbanism. And the second limitation is that I only looked um, for contemporary developments. Of course, having in mind like the, the really important scholarship on um, dictatorial urbanism and in the 20th century from planning history. But this was something I did not look at in this literature review. So what you see here is like a list of those countries that show a significant rise of authoritarian tendencies over the last decade. So you have there like the classical democratic countries such as US, for example, and but also like autocracies that nevertheless such as Russia that nevertheless showed even more autocratizing tendencies in the last decade. And for these countries, we looked, we did like a keyword analysis um, of 12 international journals in urban studies and urban planning between 2010 and 2021. And you see here like um, on the right, always the number of thematically relevant articles for each autocratizing country we identified and collected. Um, before I move like a bit more closely into the state of research, a general remark um, on the table. You see that it's like a really highly uneven distribution of articles on the different countries. This is uh, perhaps not surprising that much of the literature on are on cases from the US, also from Turkey, India and Brazil, and there is hardly little or any engagement with the effects of autocratization on urbanism in uh, contexts such as Africa, Asia, but also like if you look here in this list um, on Southeastern European countries. Um, just actually, we know very little about the effects of these new autocratization tendencies in the last two decades or so on urbanism and much of what we know is like really centered on just a couple of a small number of contexts and cases so to say. Um, a closer look then revealed that there are actually two subfields that engage with these contemporary forms of authoritarian urbanism. Uh, on the one hand, you have like urban developments in authoritarian regimes. So those studies that study urban developments, its characteristics, um, its effects in autocracies, and uh, so to say the dynamics, the workings and the materialization of urban space production in these regimes. And on the other hand, you have a field um, like on authoritarian neoliberalism, post-democracy, post-politics, they often uh, use like uh, slightly different um, terms. But um, they, what they try to do is to look at how our democracy, how democracies are undermined through contemporary forms of neoliberalism. So I will now look at both subfields in a bit more detail and see how they conceptualize authoritarian urbanism. And I'll start with the latter, the second one. So if we look at this field of authoritarian neoliberalism, then we see that it emerged like from the new millennium onwards, more or less, and was pretty early also taken up in urban studies. Um, the main argument here is that contemporary forms of neoliberal urban development jeopardize um, democratic processes and that this in turn encourage authoritarian tendencies. So um, studies here um, analyze the different mechanisms through which this takes place. So for example, um, the rise of so-called spaces of exception in which like regulations for urban planning, including requirements for public participation are not applied or bypassed 
or also the rise of new governance arrangements, such as public-private partnerships, where responsibilities, former public responsibilities, are outsourced to non-elected bodies, and where also democratic procedures are bypassed. Um, it's important to note that this field mostly emerged like from Western democratic contexts, especially US and UK, but is meanwhile um, really used to analyze processes of authoritarian urbanism around the globe, such as in cases of India, Turkey, etc. Um, many works in this field but not, well, not all of them explicitly, but many of them do draw on a practice-based understanding of authoritarianism. This, um, this somehow reflects like a change in the way authoritarianism is approached. So usually um, it was used to describe states in which free and fair elections do not regularly take place, in which like freedom of expression and assembly as well as access to information are restricted. That was like the classical um, definition of authoritarianism. But in recent years, like we, we can observe like a shift away from this national level um, to a more practice based perspectives. Um, and such approaches then rather ask how authoritarianism works also on a local level and analyzes authoritarian practices in various forms of government. The political scientist uh, Malis Glasius provides a definition. She argues that authoritarian, and you see here the, the quote on the slide, that authoritarian practices are patterns of actions that sabotage accountability to people over whom a political actor exerts control or their representatives by means of secrecy, disinformation and disabling voice. Jens and Schütze further argue that authoritarian practices are preventing the possibilities of dissent they render deeply political questions into matters of seemingly only technical concern. They repress oppositional activism with the overall purpose of enabling capital accumulation. So this approach therefore does not systematically classify governments um, or institutions as authoritarian or not but applies the term instead to specific practices, which may be more or less endemic to the overall mode of governance. It is thus quite suitable to, to study authoritarian elements and practices in urban developments like across different contexts and different regimes. The second subfield, urbanism in semi-authoritarian or authoritarian regimes, um, in contrast, really focuses on the regime sustaining and stabilizing functions of urbanism. So studies in this field um, look at how space production actually is used to mediate the relationship between state, civil society and private business in authoritarian regimes. Or in other words, um, they shed light on the question how urbanism is instrumentalized as a regime sustaining mechanism. Um, and literature here identifies different functions, how this could work, namely legitimacy, repression and cooptation. So measures of building legitimacy could, for example, include the promise of providing housing, other basic infrastructures, but also safety, um, but also like something like showing strengths, showing growth through um, important flagship projects or mega projects. Repression um, often comprises like, for example, forced expropriations, which often affect marginalized population groups, but also various measures to restrict rights, for example, in public spaces, such as, for example, oppositional activities. And then the studies of cooptation, so the, the binding of elites or certain population groups to those in power, here it's a mostly like or one issue that is often discussed is like the appeasement of opposing groups. So, for example, through aesthetically pleasing um, urban development programs, but also the cooptation of economic elites, for example, through clientelistic or neo-patrimonial arrangements. 
Um, if we ask how authoritarian urbanism is conceptualized in these studies, so again, like in most um, articles and studies, we do not find like an explicit definition, but they engage like with these different functions and workings of urbanism as sustaining authoritarian regimes. So the, the term authoritarian here most often refers to the type of the regime in which the workings of urbanism are then analyzed. Um, importantly, like such a conception then also potentially comprises the rise of non-authoritarian practices. So for example, the, the seemingly or real democratic elements such as public participation and their role like in maybe strengthening or undermining authoritarian regimes. Um, so the, the question is, so they, they include this question in how far these elements become more widespread and what their effects are. I would now like to discuss like both approaches with regard to the case of Moscow, the capital city of Russia, where I, as um, Lydia already said, conducted like lived and researched and conducted empirical research already for a couple of years. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the time today to delve into all details, but instead I will try to highlight like those aspects that uh, seem to me really crucial for today's topic. Um, what you see here are just some images that reflect like the profound transformations that Moscow underwent uh, since 2010. In 2010, a new mayor was appointed, Mayor Sergei Sabyanin, and this act was also, also meant at the same time the reintegration of Moscow into Vladimir Putin's power vertical. And it was also the kickstart of the so-called Moscow urban revolution. So what you see in these pictures is like a certain shift from these chaotic developments that characterized the early post-Soviet developments, this focus on infill developments, on um, little regulation, to this new approach, um, which focuses on green infrastructure, on public spaces, on participation, on seemingly more transparent developments, etc. Um, so this, this profound transformation and this new phase of Moscow urbanism at the same time fall into a period when we in Russia experience growing recentralization and rising authoritarian tendencies. So here a couple of buzzwords that um, the city of Moscow uses to characterize its new image. So it's about walkable human scale urbanism, progressive, green, healthy, but also like for people, transparent, accountable and open. And uh, what is in important is it, this is not only like buzzwords, but like at least some of these aspects are indeed like implemented through comprehensive public programs. You see just some of them here, something like Maya Ulitsa, for example, so my street where like um, hundreds of public spaces are upgraded in the city of Moscow. Or also there is another program where like hundreds of green spaces and green infrastructures are upgraded. So it's really like a profound change that shapes Moscow like from these glass towers to a city comfortable and convenient to live in. That's like the new logo of the city, the comfortable city. We also have this shift from this less affair to re-regulation, to transparency, to high quality or open spaces, um, and uh, also towards at least seemingly more democratic and accountable ways of city making. So, for example, there's a rise in participation processes. There are several e-participation platforms that emerged. There is also evidence-based governance and lots of surveys are carried out on how people like the different programs. Um, these developments indicate that um, even though there is still much repression and plenty of examples for it in, in contemporary Russia and Moscow, in urbanism there nevertheless seems to be a certain shift 
towards the preference of buying the loyalty of different groups, um, of different actor groups. So you have like this mimicking designs and forms of democratic progressive contexts. You have um, this kind of providing urbanism as means to buy loyalty, to calm down opposition, to co-opt subversive groups. And there is also this trend towards making more and more use of tools that resemble democratic institutions. As I said, like this rise of evidence-based governance and participatory planning. Um, and of course, at this point, we have to ask them um, how to interpret the rise of participatory planning, for example, and um, are they practiced like in Moscow in a full democratic sense? Well, um, studies um, in this field indicate that this is not the case, that very often it's like practiced in a rather superficial, often non very transparent and sometimes fully faked. But um, with regard, uh, I think there is a good, good, uh, good way to, to grasp it, like with regard to the introduction of open government, the political scientist Vladimir Gilman argued that in Western democratic contexts, um, such tools are used as complementary mechanisms to democratic institutions and governance. While in the case of Russia, he argues that their introduction is more of a substitute mechanism for democracy um, and has therefore hardly imp really empowered citizens. Um, however, um, so far we don't have clear answers to this question and like um, studies are very few. And so if we look a bit more broadly on studies which generally analyze the emergence of democratic elements in authoritarian regimes, the, then, then still we find very contradictory results on their effects. So some argue that they do have subversive effects and can really lead to change, while others argue that these elements really have a regime sustaining function and can even deepen authoritarianism. So th therefore, I think it's crucial, in my opinion, that despite like the shortcomings in, in the democratic shortcomings, um, if we look at how these new elements are practiced, we cannot simply like dismiss them as total fake or completely irrelevant. So therefore, I think we, we have to take them seriously and further engage with their effects and with their working. Um, so in, in how far then um, could these two approaches that I presented before of studying authoritarian urbanism help us to understand what is going on in Moscow to make sense of these processes and where do they have like blind spots, so to say. I think the first approach um, can help us um, to draw attention to the political functions of urbanism, really the regime sustaining functions of Moscow urban change. There is so much literature and I also very often use the framework of neoliberal urbanism, for example, to explain what is happening in Moscow. But I think this, this captures some aspects, but it does not capture many aspects. So I think like this political function is essential to understand what happens in contemporary Russia, because here urbanism was really re-established as an active political project an active state intervention, first on the local level in Moscow, but meanwhile, also like Putin at the national level has taken up this idea uh, and, and gives speeches about the necessity to upgrade public spaces and upgrade the cities and make them more comfortable throughout Russia. And I think like the, here, this framework really helps to include this dimension. So, um, which is also seen here in, the, in this quote, that really this political function. So I think this approach can help us to, to, to understand this legitimizing and co-opting functions of urbanism. Um, and therefore, if we go one step further, um, it could be argued that the current form of urbanism, despite or perhaps because of the integration of participatory 
and evidence-based planning helps to sustain and strengthen an increasingly authoritarian rule. So in this case, um, or seen from this approach, authoritarian urbanism would then comprise any attempts of governing through urbanism by authoritarian leaders in authoritarian regimes, which could also comprise democratic elements. Um, if we look at the second approach, authoritarian urban neoliberalism, this practice orientation, um, to delve like deeply into the concrete workings of Moscow urban developments, for example, the participatory planning, um, then I think that from such a perspective, the novelties implemented under the new mayor Sobyanin might well be interpreted as even if often like only superficially um, practiced, but nevertheless as making the the whole more like maybe less authoritarian and more accountable. This is of course not a problem per se, but um, I think that a problem might arise at the point where we cannot conceptualize the rise of democratic practices within authoritarian regimes as authoritarian urbanism, even if they might help to sustain an authoritarian regime. So I see certain limits here. So um, to sum up, um, well, um, against like this background of rising authoritarian tendencies, the research on the interplay of authoritarianism and contemporary space production is gaining traction. Um, today I have discussed like merely two approaches that seek to further develop this direction. Um, and try to compare them regarding their potentials, but also maybe limitations um, based on the case of Moscow. So I, I think that this practice-based approach is very fruitful in that it breaks with this, um, we cannot compare logic and allows for comparisons like beyond different types of regimes, which is I think a very promising endeavor, like me as someone coming from Austria, living in Germany and doing also much research in Russia, there is also always the question, how can I compare like Russia and Germany and Austria? How does this work? I think here such a perspective might really help. Um, at the same time, I think the strengths might also be a weakness or become a weakness because due to its focus on practices, it cannot account for the rise and meaning of democratic elements in authoritarian regimes, which nevertheless is becoming a more and more widespread phenomenon. But this would then not be counting as authoritarian practices any longer. Um, what is more, um, well, I see like the potential of this practice oriented approach in general. I think it's problematic that the literature, especially on authoritarian neoliberalism, starts from the assumption that the rise of authoritarian practices is a result of growing neoliberalism. This might be the case in several contexts and cases, but not necessarily in all. I think that's really a matter of empirical investigation. So for Moscow, for example, the argument that rising authoritarianism is a consequence of neoliberalism is simply not plausible in, in my view. And I think that both these shortcomings are related, I think, um, to the contexts um, and cases from which um, this field emanated, namely the perceived threat of rising authoritarian elements in liberal democracies and the resulting need to find a vocabulary and an explanation for what is happening there. Um, I, I also find it indicative here that um, the rise of Democratic elements in authoritarian regimes is very often, if you look at literature, referred to as fake democracy, while the rise of authoritarian tendencies in democracies is like generally treated differently, namely as a real threat to democracy, and hardly anyone um, would call them like fake authoritarianism. Um, how come? Um, there, there still seems to be a certain biased view 
which perceives like democracies as normal or the wishful and autocracies as the other, so to say. And um, the other, which is still very often not conceptualized in its own right and uh, attempting to understand its own inner logics and dynamics. So I think um, to sum up, it would be very fruitful to somehow bridge the gap and bring like both approaches together. But I think it's um, crucial to put into focus the question um, how urbanism is like instrumentalized by ruling authorities for political purposes, also for sustaining authoritarian regimes, and uh, maybe also to, to be able to conceptualize the changes therein, also as a reflection of how authoritarian regimes as such work and how they change over time. Um, so this new phase of authoritarian urbanism and the rise of democratic elements might be an essential and productive element of contemporary authoritarian regimes without per se assuming that this makes them more or less democratic because I think this is really a matter for empirical research. And here I'd like to stop my presentation um, and probably stop the sh screen sharing so that I can come back to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, so the time is now the time of questions. Maybe you have some in the audience. Well, at the beginning, it's always a, a little bit difficult, so I will start. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting, uh, very surprising uh, because uh, a, a lot of theoretical, uh, a rich theoretical approach about what authoritarian urbanism is. Uh, by the way, I would like to start with this question. You, you talked a lot about authoritarian, authoritarian urbanism and not architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say, because you you explain uh, a lot about the process of urbanism, how uh, in governance and uh, political processes the, the city is uh, designed, but you did not uh, show us many slides of uh, landscapes, urban landscapes. And uh, my question is very simple. Would you say that there are some, um, uh, there is a morphological dimensions uh, of uh, authoritarian um, urbanism, that is to say, do, do you uh, think that you, we, we can uh, assess, say, say that there is uh, authoritarian architecture? <laughs> um, I, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think like if we if we look at the designs really like from a design dimension, then I don't think so. Um, this is a exactly what I meant when I was saying that very often um, at the moment, for example, in Russia, even though there is this really difficult relation uh, with the West, so to say, but they really use very progressive design trends, really like um, urban space um, production that could also be like the same, let's say, in Berlin or, you know, it's really, if you look at it, um, you, you wouldn't know. It's, there is nothing like authoritarian in the way it looks, not at all. So I think if uh, we, if this framework makes sense, then at the level of how the city is produced, like uh, so beyond the facades, so to say. So how the architecture is produced, how the urban space is produced, who is producing it, who has the power to decide, who is included in these processes. And um, I think here, where are the decisions taken? Uh, I think if we find this authoritarian somewhere, then like behind the scenes, so to say. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Gilles Jusquier, raise the hand. Yes, and do you hear me? It's okay? 
Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I am not in this uh, area of research, so uh, very sorry if my question is not uh, very uh, well tuned. Uh, so um, we, you, we are in a, we are in an um, um, authoritarian uh, urbanism, and uh, I wonder if. Uh, in a participative approach, we may have uh, some uh, possible uh, vector of uh, opposition against a project, for example. And uh, in your research, uh, do you see some project where uh, when, when we have this participative approach, we, we may have uh, some uh, projects that can be stopped? And uh, how we can uh, provide uh, new ways to propose novelty and uh, disruptive approach with uh, with an, uh, a participative approach. So in an authoritarian one, we can see that uh, um, we propose something, someone propose something, but uh, may propose uh, uh, big uh, things for the, for the city, for example. Perhaps it may be uh, more difficult with, uh, uh, with, um, with a, a participative approach, uh, with, uh, um, for example, in a, in um, in a quarter in district in neighbor in uh, in Lyon, we have uh, around uh, 100 uh, discussion uh, meeting uh, around a project, and uh, it is not uh, at the end. It's against the project because they don't want to to have this project. So, do you have uh, do 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 you study uh, do you have studied this kind of thing uh, in your research? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we yes. Um, uh... We once we really compared also such conflicts like in these participatory practices like in Germany, Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine, and it was really interesting because in a German context, we often complain that we have so much participation that um, we actually never come to implement anything. So there is like this um, debate about how um, in the end, like everybody is against anyways and like opening the table before not necessarily makes it like better or, or whatever. So there is uh, these debates like in, in Russia, there um, like projects have been stopped, but very often rather by urban activism. So not by like state um, designed participation um, workshops or whatever, but rather is through real like protest. Um, mm -hmm. But very often, this um, very often there was protest and it had no effect. So the investor nevertheless like built uh, what whatever he wanted. So this also very often happened. But there are cases where this was really successful and where the mobilization was really successful. The studies there are very few studies uh, so far because it's rather new. Like this participatory planning in Russia is not yet so widespread. So they are. There are very little studies so far, and those that so far exist are rather critical. They say that, um, and you you can also see it like um, if like such workshops are are organized that go beyond the legally required participation, it's a very superficial thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not shall we build this, but it's rather do you want the green or the yellow image campaign. You know, it's like <laughs> so it is uh, some kind of uh, participation, but it's in a very controlled, controlled spaces and regarding very con topics that the state can really control and where any decision does not really hurt in so far. But we will see. I mean, I I am nevertheless a bit more optimistic here about the long term effects because anyways, you practice um, democracy there, even uh, yeah. if it's like on, on small issues. But I think like in the longer term, there might be like longer term effects of this. OK, thank you very much. A second question, it's, it's very quick. Uh, it's on it's the road space, space in uh, uh, authoritarian, authoritarian uh, urbanism. urbanism. And, and I wonder, I wonder if, if uh, so sorry, I, I will go continue with that. Um, in the role of space, I wonder if uh, in an authoritarian urbanism we have uh, uh, 
an organization, an organization of space, which is different uh, from uh, a participatory approach. For example, uh, we have shop, school, and uh, iteration around space on, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a pattern, for example, with uh, this kind of organization. And uh, perhaps uh, to come back to the, the question and the, the comment of, uh, of Lydia, on the possible uh, impact, uh, 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 the, the possible impact of the scale, also because uh, we perhaps uh, have we um, have we got a more large project with the authoritarian approach, for example, than in a, in a participative one? Because uh, in France, for example, we are working on a, a several kilometers, but not not uh, not on a very large uh, area. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm not sure it's very uh, clear. I no, I I understand what you mean. I'm, I, it's really interesting. I just thought, and I, I didn't think about it. But now that you say, I mean the the scale of the projects. Also, if you look at this public um, up like the public space upgrading projects that are underway in in Moscow, I th it would be impossible to implement it in at this scale and at this pace like in any German city, I think. So here definitely the scale and uh, how fast this is implemented. I think this is really something that <laughs> at least in, in how like uh, in Fran uh, France, it seems to be similar to Germany. <laughs> like mm. It's uh, actually impossible that we could um, implement something of this scale so quickly. Yeah. So yes, here definitely there, there is a difference. So mm. yeah, I would say yes. So, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the questions. Is there another question in the audience? Yeah, I thought today I will not speak about housing estates because this is what we will discuss in April. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Waiting for for next question, I would have a comment of your response to Gilles' uh, question, uh, the first one. Uh, you answered him saying that uh, when people are asked about uh, in a participative approach of a project, uh, people claim that it is a kind of a joke because they are only asked about the color of the paper wall and so on. It is exactly the same in France. <laughs> when you open the box of participation, it is never big enough. Mm. And uh, people are always frustrated about uh, what happens, and uh, if it is always if this is also a point where author authoritarian regime uh, meets uh, democratic regime because I still argue that we live in a democracy in France, <laughs> although some some people argue that not. Uh, but these are very plastic words, you know. Mm. And the participation uh, box is never big enough for mm -hmm. people once you have present it on the table. So it is a uh, it is an, an endless uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I think this is also like an issue that I or a problem I have with this um, approach of um, authoritarian neoliberalism that interprets like any form of not full participation very quickly as some authoritarian elements, even though it's just very often it's just how representative democracy works. So <laughs> the, the uh, so it's I would totally agree. Like there there is never like there seems to be never enough, and the framework against which is it is measured is very often like the full direct form of democracy. And I think this is also something very problematic in this approach to call everything that is not like. Uh, uh, where a decision is not um, taken by direct democracy, not everything um, else is um, autocratic. And I think this is uh, also some very problematic issue in this practice approach. Because it always, um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe I, I just thought while preparing the lecture, maybe, uh, I, I don't know uh, if you can say it like this, but if I think the 
the increasing role of certain democratic elements and practices in authoritarian regimes is important that they keep on working. But I think a certain level of, if you want to call it authoritarian practices, maybe it's also essential for democracies to work. I don't know. You know <laughs> I don't know if you can say that, but. Is there another question? online on the chat or by voice. So if I may say so, I, I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union was known as, uh, no, uh, let's get back to Russia. Uh, Russia today is a authoritarian regime, but also very nationalistic one. Uh, the, the proudness of the Russian past is very important in the national politics of Vladimir Putin. And, um, and in the urban landscape, we can see examples of neo-Stalinistic uh, objects of architecture. Uh, so coming back to urbanism and of the way uh, the politics uh, talk right about the city and about architecture, uh, do you find in uh, a kind of ideology, a uh, neo-nationalist ideology of the city of architecture, which would be a kind of a politic tool to assess the authority of the regime? So does the making of the city help the government to, uh, thanks to nationalism, uh, to, to stabilize its, uh, its authority on the society? Mm -hmm. um, I, I totally, I, I, I would totally say yes, it, it helps, but I think that the, the Russian authorities are, how to say, pretty clever in their current approach, because on the one hand you have these neo-Stalinist, neo-classicist um, forms and this revival, um, and they provide this because it's very important for their, for their image. Um, but on the other hand, like uh, it's not that ideological. So the the authorities are very open to to also understand that like um, a well educated um, Western oriented middle and middle upper class is uh, like has emerged in Russia and especially in Moscow and demands like other things. And so they also provide things that look very democratic, that look very progressive to them. So they they have a very, yeah, they, so they, they really um, provide things for different actor groups to accommodate these different wishes. So that there is not, so I would not say it's a very strict ideological line in terms of design, it's rather will make um, everything in order to stay in power and we very actively use the urban environment to do so. Mm. But to cater for different groups and for different needs and demands. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, there is some. Uh, what did I see? Ah, Genola. Genola has a question. Please, Genola. Can you open your camera, please? Oh, yeah, fine. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much, Daniela, for your presentation. Um, I had a remark, which is not very clear, maybe, maybe about, about the, the moment. moment. Uh, uh, but I was, I was wondering when you introduced the um, uh, the Moscow case, you first started by explaining how it was under Lushkov and then Sobyanin as if there was big shift between them in terms of participation. Of course, it's clear because uh, now there is new uh, tools like this um, active, active new Grajdanin and so on. But um, uh, quite recently with Daria that, that you know, we made interviews with uh, inhabitants uh, and some of them uh, have had experiences of uh, uh, participation, participation already uh, more than 50 years ago. So for them, this shift, this, this shift was not that clear. Um, for example, uh, when they uh, wanted to get involved in land, survey, land, land surveying processes, like to divine uh, the land. Yeah, so I was just 
uh, I just wanted to ask, is it very relevant to, to separate to separate these two periods of time when we consider public participation in the case of Moscow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, definitely it was there already before. Also like I uh, think in, uh, so public hearings are like legally inscribed into the Russian planning system and uh, oh, I forgot uh, in which year they re this really entered in force, So, but it was really early. So the, like the, the formal mechanisms of public participation, the public hearings, they have been there like much well before. The only thing that is new is like that um, our I think like in general, there was never this clear break between Lushkov and Sabyanin in many regards. It was rather like making some changes so that everything can stay the same. Um, but what is different is that um, th this focus on, you know, like this focus on transparency, this active so acknowledging this as an important tool because it was there already before, but they introduced like new instruments and they make it there like they also really refer to it as very important. I think this is something that is different. If it's really different um, from the point of view if, of inhabitants, if they like in general have more possibilities to participate, I think that's yet an open question to be seen. But I think that so I think yes and no, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the question. Does anybody has a question? I was thinking on my on my Bernard. side about oh, there is a question maybe. See Bernard, Bernard, yes. Bernard, please, please. I'm going to have a question. How do uh, the the regime in Moscow and the planning in Moscow uh, take into account uh, the environmental sciences, sciences such as, such as climate, climate science, science or biodiversity or, or uh, infiltration of, of, of rainwater, etc. How do they deal with that? Do they integrate it into their thinking, or are they still using uh, a form of urbanism that would go back to the 60s or even before that? Mm. Mm. It's a tricky question because I have not really engaged with it. I can only say, like, from what I looked at, from what I looked at, like. Um, it became part of the image to be to provide green and healthy cities and what they do is they try to strengthen green infrastructures um, there are programs for that but at the same time if you look at what is happening um, Moscow is densified I mean the, the housing renovation program is about demolishing like several thousand buildings and uh, building them anew with much more high higher densities so from this point of view um, it's of course a really a drastic uh, really bad <laughs> yeah, I cannot say it differently, really not in the direction of biodiversity or something related to ecology, because um, the city is already very dense. There are problems with heating, with air, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and making it even more dense and uh, providing ever less like um, open space um, is definitely um, no, I, I don't see here. So I see it in terms of image making. I see it in terms of a certain um, view to recognize the importance of green infrastructure. But if you look at the total building practice, I'm skeptical. I mean, they invest a lot in public transport again, really a lot. It's very uh, impressive if you look at uh, 
the, the metro lines in Russia, the official website, you can click by every year, you know, from, from when the metro was um, opened until today. And you see like in the last couple of years, how the metro net, like the, the underground metro net really was enlarged. But at the same time, the traffic congestion is like still like, uh, so, uh, some uh, some small steps, but like I think the most things are not going in, in in such a direction. I would say if you look at the really big things that are happening, road construction, this housing renovation program, there I don't see don't see it. So are these programs really market driven? Or are they really imposed by the by the municipal or the state authorities? Oh, that is a difficult um, question in Russia because the state and the market are very much intertwined in Russia. So the the big companies um, that make their money or the, the really really huge companies where it's really about large profit making are either state led or very close to the circle of the ruling authorities um, and so this is very hard to say also if you look at this renovation project and Ginola is an expert on that that's of course on the one hand a lot about profit making but um uh, so it's definitely a locomotive of to overcome the crisis, also the economic crisis in Russia. But um, the, you, in Russia, the separation between state and, and private economy, that's really difficult, really, really difficult to make. But so it's profit it's, driven. That's what I wanted to. Yes. Say. So it's there is the, market driven. It's profit driven. Somebody profits from from it. OK, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are coming to to the to the end of the conference, maybe, unless there is a, a last question. Not in the chat for the moment. So if there is no uh, more questions, so I will thank you again very much, Daniela, for your conference. Uh, uh, we are still in touch for the organization of your field mission in, in Lyon, of course, and we will uh, get, uh, we will inform uh, f uh, through EMU of, uh, of our next seminar, which uh, will be open to everyone, but physically this time, not online. <laughs> it will be better. <laughs> so people in Lyon will be able to to, to discuss with you and, and with us about uh, the renovation of large housing estates in a comparative approach with colleagues of the uh, laboratory of EVS. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for the invitation and thanks for your questions. And I'm very looking forward to see you in Lyon in, in real. <laughs> yeah, in the real life. <laughs> real life. <laughs> so Laura, are you still here? Yes, of course. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Lydia. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here. And see you very soon. Yeah, yeah. In April. <laughs>